All right, thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to talk about what is post-construction stormwater management. We've been out, as Wayne has said, I don't know if he said it today, but I know he said it yesterday. We've been out to all but three of the MS4s in the state, uh, phase one and phase two, since 2007. Uh, we've been working on that endeavor. We should have it finished um, this year. December is our last evaluation for this go-round. We're kind of excited about that. I don't know if the rest of you are excited, but <laughs> at least we've been out to see everybody. I know quite a few people in the audience uh, through the evaluations and uh, through today's conference. So one of the things that we've encountered as we've gone through our evaluations is it seems like post-construction this minimum control measure is the one that gives us the most trouble, that people seem to have the most confusion on what's required, what do you have to do to meet this minimum control measure uh, in order to have a good stormwater program. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about what is it, what does it mean for you as an MS4 stormwater program manager or someone who, a city official, someone who has responsibility for implementing this MCM? What's out there that you can use? What's the technology that's available, both non-structural and structural BMPs? Uh, and then what's been done in Oklahoma? As I've been going through uh, putting this presentation together and researching, I, we had encountered some things that have been going on in Oklahoma just through our evaluations. People like to point out where they've got rain gardens installed and things like that. So I knew about some of these things, but then there were other things as I was doing research that I found that I didn't realize you know, those things were out there. So I'm gonna to try to bring some of those things to your attention as we go through this today. So because I'm with DEQ, here's the regulatory part of this presentation. We've got, the, it's, I think it's de rigor. You have to have it. At least so you know, if you're not familiar with it, this is right out of OKR04, right out of the permit. What do you have to do? What does the permit say you have to do? So you have to develop, implement, and enforce a program to address stormwater runoff from new development and redevelopment for projects that disturb a, an acre or greater or those that are part of a common plan of development. All right, so what else do you have to do? You have to put, if you've got your program, what do you have to do? You have to develop and implement strategies as well. Those can be uh, structural or non-structural BMPs. Structural BMPs are those that are you know, something you install, something construction, constructed, like retention ponds, detention ponds. Those are some of the most familiar things I think that everybody's aware of. But then there's grass swales and rain gardens, and we'll talk about those as we go through the presentation. And then there are those non-structural BMPs. And non-structural BMPs seems, that's the hardest, I think, for most people to get a grasp of and to figure out what are they, what else is there. I mean, it's easy to think about things you can install, but what are some of those non-structural things, some things that don't involve construction that you could use to meet this minimum control measure? And those are things that are more planning related, education related, uh, like directing growth and development in your city to certain areas, uh, protecting sensitive areas, minimizing impervious area, um, and, and just providing education to your citizenry. And we're gonna talk about those as well, okay? You also have to have an ordinance or, an, or some other type of regulatory mechanism that requires post-construction uh, BMPs to be installed in your community. Um, and then ensure that there's adequate long-term operation and maintenance of BMPs. That's one of the things when you're developing this program or as you're moving forward in your program, make sure you've got a process to address who, how, when, and what happens if that BMP measure is not maintained. This is gonna be, and I think has led to some difficulties for cities because how do you deal with those privately owned structural controls that are out there and what happens when they're not maintained? How do you then make sure that they are maintained? Uh, is it something that you can address through a nuisance ordinance and then go through and do the maintenance yourself and then pursue abatement on it? Uh, it's something that you'll need to consider if you haven't already for your program, okay? So that's the regulatory side of things. That's what comes out of the permit. So what is it really when it comes down to putting it into place? It's control of stormwater runoff after construction is complete, okay? So you've got to have your ordinance. Uh, one of the things that we've run across in our evaluations is 
the ones that are out there, a lot of them require that, that post-construction hydrology doesn't exceed pre-construction hydrology or pre-matches post, depending on how you want to word that there. That's something that's out there a lot. But there are other ways to do it, but you have to have that ordinance. You have to make sure that you have a method in place to ensure that that ordinance is, follow, is followed. And that's through your plan review process. When you get those development plans in, do you review that to look at what structures are going to be in place after construction is complete to, modif to minimize the amount of water that's being discharged off the site? Um, and the other thing is enforcement. How are you going to make sure, you know, what's the mechanism that you have to enforce should these requirements not be followed? And then a selection of methods or ways to meet ordinance requirements, that's always helpful to have for your program, as well as a way to ensure that maintenance occurs over the long term, like we just talked about. How do you make sure? You know, even with your retention and detention ponds, how do you make sure that they're maintained through the life of those ponds, you know, through changes of HOAs, when HOAs dissolve, how do you deal with that? If it's owned by an, a, a single private owner, what happens when it changes hands? How do you make sure that as it changes hands that the new owner is aware of the maintenance requirements uh, that have been agreed to and might be included in the plans for the development? Okay. It, we have found that post-construction stormwater management is related to flood control. They both address stormwater runoff from parking lots, streets, roofs, uh, as well as you know, the destination. Does it, is it infiltrated or is it just sent directly off site? So a question you need to ask as you're reviewing your program is, do you have ordinance that cover both post-construction stormwater runoff and flood control? And if you have both, do they conflict? Are there any areas that might need to be changed so that, you know, if you had somebody looking at both, uh, they didn't say, well, you can't make me do this because what you say in your flood control regs doesn't match what you say in, in post-construction. Um, and then can one or both be modified to encourage green infrastructure over gray infrastructure? And here's an example of green versus gray that I found the green street here in Portland that's got the little curb bump out with the rain garden there and then this is just what we see traditionally uh, it's a traditional street in Oklahoma during rain which we haven't had for a while but you know sometimes our streets look like this okay so what isn't it you know we know kind of now what it is what isn't it it's not simply a duplication of your construction stormwater program uh, we have had that brought up well we make sure that we have you know, we meet the termination requirements of OKR 10, 70% background cover, uh, at final stabilized, no construction activities. Well, that's not really post-construction stormwater control. That's the last part of your construction MCM, okay? How do you go further into post-construction? Um, they're closely tied, your construction and your post-construction uh, programs are gonna be closely tied, uh, because when you get that, con that development plan in, you're going to get it before construction. So you're going to be looking at what BMPs are going to be in place during construction. But you also need to then pay attention to that for after construction. How is the runoff going to be handled post construction, after construction is complete? And if you have different plan reviewers looking at those different elements, do they know that they're related? Are they talking to each other to make sure that those that all of the issues are addressed? Okay, um, and they may need to consider different elements. Make sure that they're not just looking at it for, they're not just looking at the site during construction. Make sure they think of how it's what it's going to look like after. Okay. All right. So one of the things I wanted to bring in, what I, what I wanted to do was cover what is it, what does it mean for you. And then to kind of give you a heads up on what's on the horizon. I think you guys have heard about as we've gone through the presentations in the last couple of days, the EPA stormwater rulemaking. That's something that's been out there. Uh, the deadline for when it's going to come out has been pushed several times, as Richard mentioned. But we're thinking eventually we're going to get something out of the stormwater rulemaking process that's occurring. Right now, EPA has said it's going to be proposed by June 10th, 2013, 
that may or may not happen, but it gives you kind of an idea of where they're headed with it. And the things that you want to be aware of in that stormwater rulemaking is that there are certain elements of it that are specifically address post-construction. One is the development of performance standards for newly developed and redeveloped sites to better address stormwater management as projects are built. So you're looking at the retention of runoff from certain size storm events on site. So when you get plans in, that's something you're going to have to look at is, you know, if they're asking you to, or if you're going to have to retain the 95th percentile storm on site for all of these sites, do you know what the 95th percentile storm is as an example? That may not be what it is. I'm just throwing that number out there. Um, do you know what it is for your area? And do you have ways for, uh, do you have alternatives listed somewhere that are acceptable for your city to be implemented at those sites? The other thing is um, they're looking at is evaluating options for establishing and implementing a municipal program to reduce discharges from existing development. This is what they call retrofit. It's been out there a lot. I, how many have heard of any of these elements of the stormwater rulemaking? You guys are a little bit familiar with it? So a few people are familiar with it. So you, you've heard retrofit, but this is something, it's gonna be a municipal program, so that means it's going to fall to you, potentially, to figure out how you're going to go back into these areas that are developed and put in BMPs to, maintain, to infiltrate uh, stormwater runoff instead of letting it go right out your system into the nearest creek or stream. Okay? So that's kind of why I wanted to bring all of that up so that you, know, you guys are aware of it. What does that mean for you? Well, it's likely that post-construction stormwater management is going to become a larger part of your stormwater program. Something you're going to have to think about. You're going to have to have a process to deal with it. Uh, so you're going to have to develop that plan to comply not only with what's coming up, but with what's already here. Okay? So that's the bad news. Like Richard said, I'm just doom and gloom right now. I can see. But what's out there? What's available? You know, it's... It's going to be difficult because it's going to be changing mindsets to make sure that they're, they're thinking the traditional way is okay for some things, but what can we do to move beyond that? We don't want to wait until the box is empty to start thinking outside of it and start moving forward. Um, uh, Shelly really set me up well this morning for this topic, so I, I really appreciate that. So what's out there? We've got non-structural controls. Like I said, that don't involve physical construction, but they're planning and management related. And I have to thank Cody for this. An example of non-structural right, BMP right there. He's giving a rain barrel class at the city of Stillwater. Um, so educating your citizenry on what's out there in post-construction stormwater management. And then there's the structural controls that involve actual physical construction. And this is a rain garden that's installed in uh, Rogers, Arkansas. Uh, they have, Northwest Arkansas has a, a program where they are working towards installing a certain number of rain gardens in Northwest Arkansas um, in various locations. I can't remember the exact details right now, but it's a very interesting plan that's going on there. And, you know, if you think about it, it's Northwest Arkansas. It's not that different than what we have here. So if it works there, it's likely it's going to work here. So something to think about there. Okay, so non-structural controls. This is the nebulous area, I think. Um, one of the ways, one a non-structural control that you could use in your program is reviewing your ordinances to remove barriers. One of the things they commonly talk about as a barrier for, post, for some of these uh, interesting LID um, BMPs that are out there are street, street width requirements. Do your ordinance specify, you know, you have to have a certain width, the two lanes with parking on both sides. Is there a way that you can reduce that and have them park on grassed reinforced pavers or something, a different alternative? Um, do you have parking lot space requirements for your uh, commercial developments? Do they have to provide a certain number of spots? Um, can that be reduced and you have a certain number of paved spots with an overflow that's grassed with um, those uh, reinforced pavers or a different type of material? Because those are the ones that are only going to be used during Black Friday and, you know, some of those really big events. Is there another way to look at it so that that parking 
could be a different type of material than just regular asphalt or concrete that we typically see. Um, another thing is, have you reviewed your ordinance to see if you have a prohibition on the use of pervious concrete or asphalt? That's one of the things we were talking to the city of Tulsa not very long ago, and uh, they were starting a, they're starting a pilot project for using pervious pavement in their city. And as they were going through that process, they realized, oh, our ordinance says uh, that we really, you're not supposed to use that in the city. So, because, you know, back, you know, 10, 20 years ago, one of city engineers said, oh, that stuff doesn't work around here. We can't use it. So they developed an ordinance that said you can't use it. So now they're going to have to go back through all of their ordinances and figure out where those conflicts exist and remove them so that, you know, now with the current technology, they can use pervious concrete. Okay, and then do you have development design restrictions that say, you know, that has to, your, design, your development has to look a certain way. Is there a way that you can condense lots and leave more green space? Are there other methods? For those of you that have post-construction programs already in place, do you have other methods? Or are there other things that you've found that you have to remove? I'm kind of interested. Julie? Sorry, Robert, we're going to have to get, get the microphone up to her. But yeah, I'd kind of like to make this a little bit more interactive. So Mickey, if you could, because I know I have stormwater managers here, so I want to know from you, because I, I know what I've seen from audits, but you tell me more. The subdivision regulation requirements a lot of times won't allow, they, they make you put in curbs and gutters and mm -hmm. sidewalks in some cases, and you can't do swales and things like that. And, in Tahlequah, we always said we were so far behind, we were ahead because... Um, right, you do still have a lot of the grass swales that... Right, in the Tahlequah ditches, they did, yeah. and, and in Bethany too, we're, we're actually, uh, they think they're behind, but they're really probably ahead because they didn't put all that in in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But now the subdivision codes say that we, you know, you have to put curb and gutter in, so okay. that's one thing that you have to look at. Okay. Anybody else have, if you've looked at removing barriers in your ordinances, what have you found? What's out there? Okay. Cricket. Richard? Hurry up. I'm coming. <laughs> oh, I forgot. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that we keep coming across is the uh, conflict between the water quality aspects of, a B, of, if you want to call it a BMP or a practice, and other considerations, particularly public safety. You know, uh, we get a lot of blowback from city planners and fire chiefs and all about, you know, one of the things would be reducing the street size. Well, you right. try to convince a fire chief or somebody that they need to do that. Sidewalks, public safety, uh, curbs and gutters, uh, engineers <laughs> can can really put up a barrier to that and in meetings I've had uh, with DEQ and other folks uh, in the past couple of years uh, one of the requirements I think that may be coming out in the new OKR04 is to look at all of these codes and identify the barriers to the these uh, LID approaches and remove them and when these issues are raised the quest the comment is uh, well if you can't remove some because of public safety issues and all, then you should uh, document that. Yeah. And, that, and it's not like you have to go in and do remove every single thing and implement every LID, but you still have to, you really ought to look at it and consider it. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're trying to get you to look at. And I think I've seen a few of uh, the annual report reviews that say look at removing barriers and that's one of the things we know that not all of these measures are going to work in every single city because you've got different structures you've got different uh, leaders you've got different willingness to implement so i'm going to give you what's out there use it as a toolbox and use what you think is relevant at the time or for your city Go ahead. Uh, one of the things you need to consider too is the economic impact that you're talking about because mm -hmm. Uh, a street without curb and gutter is going to be end up costing you more to maintain and most of the municipalities are running on very limited budgets and to put 
an extra expense on the city like that, uh, something's going to suffer. It is something to consider. We recognize the effects that you know uh, funding have. That's why we want you to look at it and see what will work in your city. And if there's something out there that you can use, try to encourage your your developers to implement some of these items. Um, you know, I'd, I think we were talking about uh, pervious concrete and how it's a little bit more expensive maybe to install initially, but it's kind of balanced by, you know, the types of maintenance that you'll have to do and, and things like that. So it may in the short term cost more, but maybe in the long term it, it won't cost as much as traditional. Pervious paving, have they come up to uh, resolve the question of the durability due to the freeze thaw issues? And the second issue with that is if you have a spill on the highway right now, asphalt or concrete typically contain it to a point. Pervious paving will let it get below the pavement and make it much more costly and expensive to remediate the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I haven't read any research as, well, as far as spills go and how you address spills. That's probably going to be a complicating factor on that. But really, right now, my understanding of pervious, the pervious pavement is it's not really designed for those heavily trafficked areas. Uh, it's designed more for parking lots and sidewalks and some of those uh, less heavily traveled areas. The other question I have is on the rain gardens, both of which pervious paving and the rain gardens are very intriguing. I see a lot of benefit from them, but uh, the, the practical side of me has questions whenever you start installing an area in, in our heavy clay soils uh, where you penetrate it with water and you subject the road and the, the curb and gutter and different things to the, uh, the swelling and contraction of the heavy clay soils. I, I, like I said, I like the idea. I'm just not sure it's appropriate next to a road in our particular soils or where you have heavy clay soils. Well, that, that is something that they've been looking at. Uh, they have been implemented in areas that have clay soils. Sometimes what's required is uh, a modified soil base to give you a little bit more retention so that it'll infiltra infiltrate through that and give you a little bit more retention time. Um, it's something to look at. It's, the research has been done. I'm not going to say I'm an expert on rain gardens and heavy clay soils, but the research is out there. So make sure if you have those concerns that you go out and research it and see what's, what is the latest science on that. Um, but as far as, and the, brought me back to the freeze thaw on pervious uh, pavement, pervious uh, concrete asphalt. Um, one of the things I'm going to bring up as we come through this presentation is the fact that in Northwest Arkansas at their Beaver Water District uh, headquarters, they have their parking lot is completely made out of porous concrete. And it's been installed since 2008. Uh, and they haven't had any freeze thaw issues. And Northwest Arkansas gets a little bit colder than it does here. so but. So it's going to be a little bit more extreme than what we would see. So if it survives there and they've had good, they've had good uh, experience with it, then it's something that could be considered here. The other thing is they've also, uh, in talking to them, since it's been solid since 2008, they haven't done any maintenance on it. They haven't done any street sweeping or vacuuming, and they're still getting good results. Uh, for infiltration. So I thought that was an encouraging sign that, you know, for four years you haven't done anything to it and it's still infiltrating. That's, that's a good sign. Okay. Regarding the uh, impervious concrete that we've been using, many cities for uh, all the last 20 years have really been pushing for uh, industrial areas uh, to uh, completely pave their parking lots. Uh, where they had used gravel in their parking areas for their large trucks and stuff for years uh, and had not had any problems and were allowing the moisture to, to go into the ground. Uh, after they started requiring impervious materials to be used, asphalt and, and concrete, uh, the runoff problem has, has grown. Also, uh, I agree that on highways and, and main major roads, that might not be a good idea, but the enormity of the use of concrete on driveways, patios, uh, sidewalks, uh, on one person's property, uh, the runoff from that is, is enormous. And uh, it, it, it's a, 
the impervious concrete is new. We, we, we need to let it work its way out so that they can actually get it, get it to working properly. But uh, we need to start backing off on our impervious requirements, especially in residential areas. Something to think about as you're, you know, looking at your stormwater program. What are those requirements that your city has, and and what can you do to encourage more pervious uh, areas in your city? Okay. All right. Good discussion. Let's talk about a few more non-structural controls. Uh, we we'll talk about directing growth in your in your city, protecting those sensitive areas. I think we talked about that. Maintaining and or increasing open spaces, if it's a possibility. Providing buffers along water bodies. Um, I think the city of Norman has done some of that already through ordinance. Uh, minimizing impervious surfaces, like we were just talking about. Encouraging infill. And then educating your builders, developers, and the public on green infrastructure, on what's out there. Okay, so those are some of the non-structural controls. So if, you know, when we get to that part of the evaluation and we ask you about what your non-structural controls are, you know, you've know, got an idea of what some of them might be. Um, this is an example of uh, that development design like we were talking about. We've got uh, the low impact site plan here as opposed to the consent, uh, conventional site plan here. You can see where they've preserved around this stream here some of the green space and they've incur you know preserved some of these open areas as well for the development now i can't say i pulled this off of the web because i liked i thought this was a good example of the development i can't say i've gone in and counted the number of lots to see if they actually lost some lots in this they may have but i've seen in other instances where they've changed the way they do the development and they don't lose lots and they still manage to get some open space, okay? Um, an example video, I think it's gonna be a little too long for the time that we have, uh, but I pulled this off the web, uh, is an LID video, it's about 14 minutes long that talks about uh, rain gardens and green roofs and things like that, that's from EPA. Might be something that you consider, you know, as using as uh, an educational device. Um, so we've talked about structural controls, so let's talk about, or non-structural controls, let's talk about structural controls. Uh, the traditional that you probably usually always think about when we ask this question, when we get to the evaluation of what structural controls do you have out there, it's usually related to retention and detention ponds. Um, those can be wet ponds or dry ponds or stormwater wetlands. Um, we won't go into much on these because I think you're all pretty well familiar with these. But then they have their maintenance issues, just like any of the other green infrastructure that we're going to talk about will have. Uh, another type of control that we have are rain barrels and cisterns. Uh, they reduce runoff by disconnecting your downspouts from your storm sewer system. It also allows for reuse. You know, if you had this installed in a, at your house, you could use it for irrigation uh, for your landscaping. Um, what we have heard as you know if I've as I've been to other uh, conferences and things like that that one of the things is uh, these use of rain barrels and cisterns is complicated by uh, water rights laws in the western states um, you know because really it, especially like in New Mexico they say that uh, that water belongs to somebody downstream who has those water rights so they really can't retain it um, I don't think most of that applies to Oklahoma um, but something to consider and one of the things, as I was putting this presentation together, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but have you seen in the presentation from Oklahoma Gardening that featured construction of rain barrels? Dr. Vogel is, is in this video um, and talks about how you can construct your own. So I thought it was pretty amazing that I, I wasn't aware that they had this already out there, but I think uh, OSU Extension is really, you know, working towards educating the public on these green infrastructure items. I think this one's a little long too. There are a couple others that I do definitely want to show you, so we'll move on on that. Uh, the other uh, type of structural control you might consider are rain gardens and bioretention. Uh, I think most everybody's probably pretty familiar with rain, rain gardens. Along with rain barrels, that seems to be the uh, type of uh, green infrastructure that's mentioned the most. It provides on-site treatment by filtering out pollutants 
It can be designed for infiltration, or you can discharge via an underdrain. Uh, I have, uh, you know, seen some research on that where they actually allow it to infiltrate to treat the water, but then they um, connect it to the storm sewer system and have some uh, discharge there. That it'll slow it, so it'll at least bring down your peak flow a little bit. Um, as a design consideration. But uh, looking at it suitable for a smaller drainage area, less than five acres. Um, and you can design it so that you use uh, drought tolerant uh, plant species. Again, thanks to Cody Wittenberg for uh, allowing me to use his photo. This is the Stillwater Community Center's rain garden. This, I think this was one of your first, wasn't it? Uh, rain garden demonstration projects in the city of Stillwater. This picture is uh, after the vegetation has established. And this was 2009 when it was installed and it's still going well, still working. I got a thumbs up from Cody, so excellent job there. So that's something that, you know, was installed here. You can keep an eye on it as it progresses, as the years go by and see what kind of maintenance. Go talk to Cody, find out what kind of maintenance he has to do on it and, and what's involved there. The other thing I was surprised to see is all of the, uh, the news features on Raiden Gardens. There's one from the Muskogee Phoenix that I came across. Uh, has a gardening bent for how people could install it, you know, how your citizenry can install it themselves to, as, a, as a feature in their garden. Um, and then a discussion on uh, volunteers in Broken Arrow and the rain garden that they built there. I think uh, Kevin Gustafson with uh, OCC uh, Blue Thumb program is uh, really influential in getting uh, rain gardens and, and different LID practices in, in installed in the Tulsa area. Um, I know he's got several at his house. He's actually installed them at his house as a, as a feature. Um, and then there's uh, Oklahoma City actually offered classes on rain gardens. And then we've got some that are installed in Norman in the Trail Woods section that we're going to talk about a little bit more when we talk about what's going on in Oklahoma. I think we've got enough time. Let's see if I can make this video work. Do we have sound? Bear with me. We've been having issues with technology yesterday, and hopefully not today. We'll see how it goes. Today we're in yeah, I was afraid this was going to happen. But again, this is an Oklahoma gardening feature. So how many people had actually seen Oklahoma gardening, this program on Oklahoma gardening, or knew it was out there? We've got a few people that knew it was out there. Tulsa visiting with Kevin Gustafson of the Oklahoma Conservation Commission. And Kevin's going to be our featured uh, I don't know that it's going to work. OK, well, we're going to put these up on the web at DEQ's website. So you can check all of these out. There's only one that I really want you to see at the end. Um, that's only two minutes, so hopefully we won't have the issue with that. Speaker this year at Garden Fest. Well, Kevin, first I want to welcome you to our show. Thank you. Um, can you yeah, it's just not going to cooperate with me today. I apologize for that. All right, but it's out there. All right, so the other thing, uh, another structural control are green roofs. I think people have heard about green roofs. They actually had a little symposium, uh, about half day workshop. Uh, Oklahoma City Sustainability Office put one on a few months ago talking about green roofs, and there were three of them that they took this to in the Oklahoma City area. Uh, they reduce peak flow discharge. They can work to uh, reduce the urban heat island effect. You can design them to use drought tolerant species. I don't know if you can see it very well, but up here, this is the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. Uh, it's in Fort Worth, and they actually, um, they didn't think that using a traditional uh, green roof planning system with succulents was really going to work in the Fort Worth area because of the droughts and the the high heat that they get. So what they did is they looked for a microclimate within the Fort Worth area that would mimic the kind of conditions they thought they'd see on their roof. So what they have up here are some native grasses. They have yucca. They have cactus. So all species that you, know, you would normally see in the Fort Worth area, but it's a green roof. 
Um, I thought that was a unique way to treat green roofs. It's different than what we've traditionally seen. Um, and then this is the Winnie May House, which is here in Oklahoma City, and that's uh, got uh, grass on the roof there. That was actually installed in 1951, so that's a, an older example of a green roof. A little bit different uh, type of design and purpose for the design, but it's something that's out there and something to consider. Watering on the green roofs. Um, from what I've read, the, uh, they may need it initially for plant establishment to make sure that you, you, know, you get your plants established, but um, they, might not, they don't need it over the long term. Um, I'm trying to remember with Fort Worth, I don't think Fort Worth did any supplemental watering because they wanted to see what species would survive. Uh, and then that would help them for future installations of that type of green roof to decide what plants were going to survive the best without the supplemental watering. Okay. This is another Oklahoma gardening feature on green roofs. The green roof that's pictured here is actually in Oklahoma City. It's on the Cardinal Engineering Building um, in, on Automobile Alley. Uh, and it's an interesting place. They set it up so that there uh, is a little um, area for their, uh, for their employees to go and, and eat lunch. It's got a, a picnic table and a little patio that you can sit out on. And then it's surrounded by the green roof structure. So I thought that one was a very interesting one as well. Um, there's green parking. Uh, re you can reduce parking lot contribution t uh, to stormwater runoff by reducing impervious surfaces and in increasing infiltration. Um, you can use a combination of porous paving, reduced lot size, and bioretention in this green parking uh, system design. And one of the things I liked about this picture that I found online was right here is the porous asphalt, and then this is the traditional asphalt. And you can see what it looks like, just the different infiltration rate um, on those two different surfaces. I thought that was a, an interesting uh, demonstration of how that worked. Um, narrower streets, like we've talked about, I know that's one of the issues uh, you know, with public safety and things like that, that it may be difficult for you to implement, um, but it has been done successfully. Uh, it reduces impervious surface and it's applicable to lower traffic volume streets like we talked about, not your arterials or your main highways and things like that. Um, but they have had successful implementation mostly on the coast uh, in Portland um, but they've, and New Jersey, but they've also in Boulder uh, instituted the narrower streets. And here you can see where, they're, where the parking, and it, it didn't show up as well as I had liked, but the parking is out here along the side, and, and this is kind of where they're encouraging the parking on that structure there. Uh, per, permeable, per, uh, pervious, and porous materials, that is a really hard thing to say at, after lunch. Uh, it includes pavers, concrete, and asphalt, so I kind of lumped them all together. They all do uh, pretty much the same type of thing. They allow water to drain through to a storage and infiltration layer. Um, like we talked about, used for parking lots, sidewalks, and residential streets. And on this, this picture here is actually um, at a demonstration pour at one of the Delisi yards here in Oklahoma City. They did that several years ago, I want to say 2008 uh, on that, where they actually showed you know, what was involved for creating a pervious uh, concrete area and then how much water would it take. And that, that picture is actually, that, the concrete truck there was full of water and they just let it go. So that's at full flow out of a concrete truck. And it did not go beyond the borders of that pad site there. So that can show you what kind of infiltration you can get uh, in a uh, pervious concrete type uh, structure. And then some uh, different uh, types of pavers to pervious parking that's available. Again, this is at the Beaver Water District in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, they had some really unique features that they had installed uh, that I hadn't seen before. Right here is their overflow parking. Uh, you can see these are the parking curbs there. Um, and what this is, is it's an area that has grass parking pavers and what they did was install a plastic grid and I wish I had been able to get a sample of what that grid looked like but they weren't giving any out so I couldn't get any. And they didn't leave any out so that I could slip it in my bag. So. 
Um, but anyway, it's a reinforcing grid that you then fill in with, with dirt and then uh, establish your grass. And then they, this is at the back of their lot where they would normally have put that last line of, of uh, parking um, that they only use when they have big public meetings at their site. They decided, well, we're not going to use that except once every month or two or so. So let's try this overflow parking. So, you know, it's normally in grass. It won't stand up to really high traffic volumes, but that overflow parking that you just have to use every once in a while, it's an option. And then this is their pervious concrete uh, parking lot right here. Um, and it was raining that day and it was really cold and uh, you didn't see any standing water on that parking lot at all. And like I said, they haven't done any maintenance on it since it was installed in 2008. You know, that was one of the things that I always wondered about in pervious, park in, uh, pervious concrete and asphalt was how often would you have to go through with a vac truck and you know, suck out anything that's in those voids because you know, that's gonna add to your maintenance costs because you're gonna have to get out there and take care of it, or at least sweep it. And, and they said nothing. It was just now getting to the point, um, I, when I talked to the gentleman there, he said it was just now getting to the point where they could see in a couple locations where it wasn't infiltrating as well as the, some of the other areas of the parking lot. And he thought that maybe you know, in the next six months or so, they were probably going to have to um, either do some sweeping or, or get a vac truck out there to clean it out. Uh, we talked about grass swales. They're also known as bioswales, biofilters, grass channels. There are any number of names for it. They're designed to treat and infiltrate the runoff. And EPA says they're a modified version of typical grass line drainage ditches. Um, one is really was really designed for conveyance only. The other is for treatment and conveyance. But one of the things that I did note as I was researching through this is that you could modify your grass swales um, to be, or your drainage ditches to be grass swales by putting in a check dam or, or some other feature to slow down the water and let it infiltrate in your soil before it's conveyed out to the creek. And uh, they used, it's one of these things, I, I could not remember exactly what they called it. This is either a bioswale or a vegetated filter strip. I can't remember. It's fountain grass, and they do have uh, an under drain here that allows it to discharge into an infiltration basin that they'd installed on site. And that's again at the Beaver Water District in Northwest Arkansas. And one of the things, well, we'll get to that. I don't want to jump the gun. We'll talk to you about it after this. The, uh, this is the infiltration basin that the water from that vegetated strip or the grass swale goes to uh, at the Beaver Water District. It's a shallow impoundment or depression. It's designed to allow infiltration, and it treats the runoff via detention and filtration. And again, it's suitable for a smaller size drainage area, but a little bit bigger than rain gardens. This is about 10 acres or less. And one of the things that they did at Beaver Water District is they used all of these uh, different types of LID practices. They use this in their public education. So you can bring in, if you have one of these projects that you're thinking about getting ready to do, and you want to show your community that these practices could be used in your community. You can also use it for education. You can bring, they have these uh, signs uh, posted out uh, throughout their site listing what each uh, BMP is, what it's used for. Uh, it's got a nice picture of how the water flows. And they bring, they bring uh, school kids out. And they have like a little scavenger hunt. They've got a frog and I think, it's, I think it's a beaver that they have to go look for. And so they have to go out and see these things as they visit the site. So they incorporate the green infrastructure. Uh, they're also their, the water treatment system for Northwest Arkansas. So they bring this in uh, to you know, talk about stormwater and, and then how it relates to the drinking water that they're getting from Beaver Lake. And, uh, and then walk them through their um, water treatment system as well. So I thought that was very interesting, the tie-ins that you can do, kind of increase the bang for your buck, if you will. Um, an infiltration trench is another type of structural control you can use. I, don't, I haven't seen any of these in person, um, and I'm not, you know, so I'm not as familiar with these, but uh, what I got from the web is, um, from the research that I did, is it's a rock-filled trench with an outlet, and it stores and infiltrates runoff. It treats the stormwater through filtration through the soil, 
Um, but they said clogging may be an issue, and they also said if you've got uh, karst topography or you've got a close connection to your groundwater, this is going to be one of the things that you might not want to use because it could lead to pollution uh, making its way into your groundwater. Um, there are also catch basin inserts. For those of you that have catch basins in your system, um, you can place these in your catch basin to remove oil and grease or sediment, trash, other types of pollutants that might make it through your system. There is the downfall that it is going to require regular maintenance because um, as you can see from some of these, those, those inserts are pretty small, so that's going to be another added expense. But it's something that's out there, something for you to consider. Um, and then another item that is out there that I haven't really seen uh, that I'd be interested to see if anybody knows of one is a sand and organic filter. Uh, in this instance, um, this is Virginia. Uh, this was in Virginia's stormwater management BMP list. Uh, there's the runoff from the parking lot goes into this, and it's a sedimentation basin. And kind of it allows uh, any of the sediment to drop out, and then it overflows via this weir into the sand filter. Uh, one of the things to consider on this, though, is maintenance is going to be required. You're going to have to refresh that sand filter bed periodically. Um, and uh, you also have to remove floatables. Um, but that's used a lot for water quality improvement. So that's one of the things. If you're in an area that you're going to have to treat your water, maybe it's a TMDL related or it's something else and you need water quality improvement, that's an alternative. And then there are vegetated filter strips. This is really a practice that was kind of adapted from agriculture. Uh, it's designed to treat sheet flow, if I can get that out, from adjacent surfaces. Uh, it slows the runoff velocity and it filters sediment, but you're going to need to make sure that you maintain street sheet flow across your vegetated filter um, or you're just going to run into real erosion and things like that um, right through your vegetated strip. Okay, so what's going on in Oklahoma? That was the long and big, that was the big list of available structural controls. What are we actually seeing going on right now in Oklahoma? And I'm going to start with the city of Norman. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, they have the Trail Woods Edition. Uh, on one side of this street, they have, they've divided, they've got a section in their development, and on one side, they've installed green infrastructure. They've installed rain gardens. Um, they have these are, the, these are the rain gardens right here that they've installed. They have disconnected the downspouts and put them, uh, sent them to rain barrels. And uh, then on the other side, they've got the traditional construction on the other side. And they all drain, both sides drain to one common area, to one final retention pond. And what they're doing is, I think they're measuring the flow, the runoff flow that they get out of, the, of both sides to compare the differences. And then they're also collecting samples, and they're going to be monitoring the pollutant levels in the discharges from both sides and, and kind of compare, comparing how well does this green infrastructure really work? And these, are, these houses that are in this neighborhood on both sides of the street are owned by normal Norman citizens. There wasn't any restriction on who could come in, whoever bought the house, they just happened to live on a street with green infrastructure. And uh, they're going to be looking at, Ideal Homes is, is the uh, developer on this, and they're gonna be looking at you know, what are all the aspects of this type of development and, you know, maintenance and, and treatment efficiency are all things that are going to be looked at in this development. It's very interesting. I'm hoping they'll, uh, you know, publish something on it so that we can all get a look at it and, uh, you know, see how well it works. The city of Stillwater, we've talked about a couple of things. They're doing some interesting things as well. They've got a rain garden at their uh, Stillwater Public Library. That's uh, this one right here. Cody, when was that one installed? 2011, that one was installed. And then they have a rain harvesting sand cistern at Skyline Elementary. That's in this picture right here. And that one was 2009. Okay. so interesting things there and then they've got their rain garden demonstration project at the Stillwater Community Center and this is what the that uh, that rain garden looked like just after they finished construction and these are all the volunteers that helped with the installation and I saw Ilda Hershey in that picture she used to work for DEQ 
Uh, and then they had the rain barrel workshop that they conducted in June 2010, some of the interesting um, practices that they're doing there. Um, we found uh, that city of Bixby had a rain garden installed at the Bentley Park roundabout, and we discovered that at um, our evaluation. They made sure to point it out and take uh, the, uh, the DEQ folks out there and show them what they'd done. And that was actually designed in-house by city of Bixby personnel, by Jared Cottle and B. Amat. Amat? Amat. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I should have practiced a little bit more, but designed in-house. So you might have talent in-house you didn't realize you had. You know, quiz them and see if it's something that's, that's within their uh, ability. Uh, City of Owasso, we also uh, found this on our evaluation. They used Inky Mat, which is a commercial product at uh, Rayola Park. Uh, it was more for a stream stabilization measure that they were looking at. They had it. Um, they had a, a stream right along the park that was really eroding, and they tried this mat. I think it seems to be working pretty well. I uh, haven't followed up on it, but uh, it looked like as they were working through it, it had worked well for them. And then they had a wetland mitigation project at uh, the Garnett Regional Detention Facility, and that's this uh, structure right here. It's a very big retention facility, um, and they were working on uh, wetland mitigation there. Uh, City of Broken Arrow. How many people are familiar with uh, City of Broken Arrow's um, Living Green program? Okay, there are a few out there. I think that was one of the early, early, uh, very first that I think I'm aware of LID um, programs in o to be set up in Oklahoma. It's voluntary. Uh, it provides incentive for LID implementation in their developments through recognition. There are four levels of certification that they can achieve based on what types of LID uh, they implement. That's bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. Um, and it's available for four types of developments. You've got residential and non-residential, the new projects, and then you've got the existing residential and non-residential uh, when they uh, redevelop. Um, that's possible as well. And I don't know, is Jeff Bigby here? I haven't seen him. No, uh, but he's was instrumental in, in getting that going in the city of Broken Arrow. He and uh, Craig Thurmond um, really brought that program forward. If you see him, ask him about it. I'm sure he'll, he'll be happy to tell you about it. And then we, uh, city of Tulsa did the pervious concrete test. Uh, they brought in the, they brought in five different concrete companies in the area to pour test patches at their public works maintenance yard. And what they want to do is they're going to monitor it for, I think it's at least a year. Um, I don't remember the exact details on it, but they're going to monitor the infiltration rate changes. Um, and they're being monitored quarterly by uh, OSU, Dr. Vogel, and, and some of his students are, are coming out and measuring that infiltration rate quarterly on each of the test spots. They want to see if there's a difference. Each concrete company is going to have their own unique way of pouring the concrete, but then they're also going to have their proprietary you know, formulation of that pervious concrete. So they want to see if, what the difference is. And you can see, this is a, a picture of when we went out there in October, and you can see this is one of the test patches, and this is another test patch, and you can see the difference. There's a, there's a difference in how smooth the surface was on each of them. There's a difference in color. Uh, and things like that. So there, there are some differences between concrete companies and what this will, what the final product looks like. And what I really wanted to show you, and I'm hoping this works, it's only two minutes, is the, um, the video on uh, this demonstration project. Everybody cross your fingers that it works. pervious concrete demonstration over here for the city of Tulsa. Uh, what we've got is five different sections that were provided by five different mini mix producers in the city of Tulsa. There we, we could evaluate the five different mix designs, both for durability and permeability, which is the flow rate of the water through the product down into the storage layer. 
So one of the key environmental components of pervious paving is during a parking lot, the life of a parking lot, when you first have vehicles on there, that first inch, inch and a half of rain typically has a, a wash of all the contaminants, debris, oil, asphalt, uh, various things that typically run off into the stormwater sewers and affect fish, frogs. And so with a pervious system such as this, those pollutants and chemicals go down, they go through the filtration media, actually into the soil and are captured before they're able to pollute watersheds and streams. Today we're here looking at uh, pervious concrete. Um, pervious concrete is essentially the same as regular concrete except it doesn't have any sand or fines within the mix. So instead of uh, the sands and the fines filling up the matrix, you're leaving with air voids within the concrete so that you can allow water to percolate through. Uh, some of these other mixes will have a few other things within them. Uh, this one right here, you can see that there's fibers within that mix. That's to help with some of the strength issues because since you don't have sand in there, your pervious concrete is going to be weaker than normal concrete. So these are some of the things that you can do to try to offset that. So that's an example of some of the things they wanted to see. Tulsa wanted to see how well the concrete would stand up to regular public works yard traffic um, and the, the dirt and the blowing dust and the different materials that you would get in your public yards, your public maintenance yards, um, probably more than what you'd see in your, uh, in your residential streets if you had a, an application there or some of your other parking lots and they wanted to kind of put it in that harsh environment and then another thing is you know um, the engineers and the other city personnel you know that's where they work and they have to come by it every day and they see it and they're hoping that exposure to it and their experience with it as time progresses you know will help them in you know, help encourage them to think about it in uses, in other uses besides their test patches. So another way to bring in an education component, and in this case, it's an education component for your municipal employees. Uh, so I thought, again, I thought that was very interesting. So if we've got a little bit of time, do we have any time? Okay, we probably don't. All right, but what I wanted to do, and I think we've kind of covered this, is it, what's going on in your MS4? Think about it, you know, what's out there? What have you put in place, but what maybe have your citizens put in place you're not aware of? It's something to think about as you um, progress with implementing your program, okay? And I think we'll just go with any questions, comments, or discussions, so we try to stay on schedule as much as possible. Thank you, Carrie. Any questions in the audience? Surely there's got to be one. I think they need coffee. I think so. All right. Um, thank you very much, Carrie. All right. Thank Wonderful. you.